remember this moment from my childhood where I was swimming in a pool, six years old, and suddenly I'm sinking to the bottom, right? I have no idea what I'm doing. I've had like one swimming lesson in my life. And so here, I'm, here am I just in the bottom of the pool and suddenly my aunt comes and grabs me by the trunks and pulls me out. And how amazing that felt, right? <laughs> to be at the bottom of the pool, not knowing what I was doing, not knowing how I was gonna get out, and for her to rescue me. Jesus has come and he's rescued us. He's rescued us from the depths of the sea, from the depths of hell. He's grabbed a hold of us and pulled us up and pulled us out. He's done a work in you and I, and apart from Christ, we know that we will sink. The reality is, is that the Bible tells us in Romans 6.23, it says, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We know that apart from Christ, we die. Apart from Christ, because of sin in our lives, we are headed towards destruction. John 10.10, 10, it says the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come to give life and life to the fullest.
stand and worship with us this morning. There's a table that you prepared for me in the presence of my enemies. 
your love rise above everything like the sun shaping the shadow in my weakness your glory appears I'm not
that you made a way for us to be right before you through Jesus. We are a grateful people this morning. Amen. Welcome to New Life Church. We are so glad that you decided to spend your Sunday here with us. If you're new here, we'd love to connect with you at our connections desk located in the back. To help you stay faithful here, we have a couple ways that you can give. You can give online at newlifeonline.org or you can use the giving box in the back. Mark your calendars because this Friday we're having a Good Friday service at our Washington campus at 630. This is going to be a time of worship, prayer, and getting to break bread together. We have a couple things back at our connection desk. First are the tickets for the daddy-daughter dance on April 30th, and they're $5 each. Another thing is, is we have Easter prayer cards. We would love to be praying alongside of you for who you wanna invite this Easter. Hey, today's the day for our Easter egg hunt. This will be after second service, so grab your baskets and get ready to catch some eggs. I was thinking, did you ever watch Disney Channel as a kid, how they would do like the... Yeah. You can do new life. I've, and you're watching New Life Church. <laughs> Sometimes we just got to have fun with our videos, right? And just whenever it happens, keep it on there and all that. So, hey, everybody. I'm so glad you're here. I'm Brian Wilmarth. I'm the senior pastor for our churches. Uh, if you're new with us, we're so glad that you've joined us this morning. Uh, thanks for making some time to be with us. And we hope that the service is meaningful for you. Um, I have one other announcement that I want to share with you that's pretty important. So um, the, the staff and the elders, we've been talking through, like, what, what are the, some of the things that we need to do um, to help make sure that Sunday morning is the best that it can be in this season? And uh, what are the, the things that we need to adjust or do differently that will just help make sure that anybody who's our guest feels a welcome, uh, they, they step into a good environment, and we're building the right kind of thing in this room on Sunday mornings uh, to allow us to worship well and to learn together from the, the scriptures. And, and we want to be mindful of how we do that for our kids, kids' ministry, and all of the different ministries that are happening uh, on Sunday morning. So to that end, we will be going to one service as of May 1st. So one service, 10 o'clock, we will be going from two services to one. Now be watching for some more information. That's our target. Uh, we may have to adjust a little bit, but we're looking for May 1st to be that first Sunday that we come to one service at 10 o'clock. Now, if you're a volunteer and you serve on Sunday mornings, you should have gotten an email this week outlining a few more details for you and what that means and some of the different, different changes that will take place. If you did not get that, I, don't, I think there's some that, that didn't. If you did not get that, please contact me or the church office. We want to make sure that we get you that video that explains more of what's happening. So if you serve on, on Sunday mornings and you didn't get that, please let us know, and we want to make sure we get that to you. But put on your calendars, May 1st. If you come to this service at 11, you're going to have missed things. So try to be here on May 1st at 10 o'clock, uh, and we'll communicate more uh, as the weeks unfold. So I just wanted to pass it on to you, um, an exciting change, and hopefully that's going to help us step into this next season of ministry really well. Uh, so thanks. Thanks for that. All right, as we turn to God's Word, would you join me in a word of prayer? God, thank you that we can gather. We have the freedom to do that. We can be present here. Lord, we are uh, so appreciative of that. And all of it is by your invitation. God, you make the way. You have invited us to come before your throne, but into your presence. And Lord, it is good. So I pray, Father, that as we worship you, uh, as, we, as we enter into your presence today, Lord, we are changed because of it. Lord, as we open up the, the Bible and, and open up these stories and see what it is that you want us to see, God, would we be different? Would we look more like you because of it? So thank you, Father. Thanks for meeting us in this time. We are grateful. Now teach us, Lord. We're ready to receive. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. So when I, ask, when I say the word home to you, what do you think of? Like when I say home, what comes to mind? It's probably your house, right? You begin to think of like, okay, this is the house that I live in. But what does that mean? Like when you think of your house, when you think of home, what are the memories? What are the words you start associating that with? Like one of the things I think of pretty quickly is Christmas morning. 
Like my kids get up and they're so excited and, and we're, we're together as a family and there's just a contentment and a joy. Like you just, you love, you love that kind of feeling, right? That, that's what home is, right? Like the idea of home, when it's ideal, it's a place of belonging. It's a place of love, contentment, fulfillment, purpose. You feel full and refreshed, right? Like that's what home is. Now I realize some people, they grow up in settings where home is not a positive thing. Like the, the association of that word, it's like not so much. But the idea of it is more like this, right? Where we just have this sense of like, mm, things are as they should be. And there's a richness that comes with home, right? Well, um, if you've lived in the area for a while, you probably remember November of 2013 when a tornado blew through Washington and knocked out so many different people's homes. I mean, hundreds, uh, hundreds of people were, were displaced. And, and you think back to a moment like that, how home can be just taken away, right? Like a place that we live, you know, where we would call home just in an instant. It's gone. Now, many people, like, they lost possessions, they lost their home, but they didn't lose home, right? Like, they, they still had their families or things like that. But, like, this just illustrates how sometimes, like, home can be gone in an instant. We're in the series called The Story. We're looking at this big story of the Bible, and we're tracing like what God has been doing with his people, particularly Israel. Well, today we, in the story, we come to the place where they lose their home. They lose their home. And our whole goal in this series, while we're, why we are walking through the scriptures in this way, is because we want you to be able to see your story, see your life in the story. See how God operating with Israel, operating in the Bible, helps us know how he operates with us. We want you to see your life in this story. And so what we've been doing is we've been tracing the big story of the Bible. And just a kind of a quick summary, we started several weeks ago in, in Genesis 1, and we looked how God created everything good. He built this beautiful world. He's like, yes, this is it. This is what I want to be. And he created humanity to be special. Like we're to come alongside him, we're to partner with him through all that he's doing, and we're to help bring good in the world. That was like what he wanted us to do. But human beings, we decided we wanted to go our own way. We, we want to do things our way. We want to be in control. We want to sit on the throne. We want to be king. And that broke everything. It messed everything up. Because that's not how, the, how it's supposed to work. Like We're supposed to work together with him, and we want to do our own thing. And we call this sin. And this sin, this rebellion, this trying to do things on our own, introduce something that doesn't belong, death. This is an intrusion into the home. It's an intrusion. It doesn't belong. And death is now one of the major problems that is, is present in creation. The sin, this rebellion, this death, like all of these things, they're not the way things are supposed to be. But God, he could have just said, you know what? I, I, don't, I won't deal with this. I'll just start over or I want nothing to do with it. No, he said, I want to fix it. I want to do something about it. So he called one guy, Abraham. He's like, I'm going to work through you. You don't have any kids yet, but you will. And I'm going, to have, I'm going to have so many kids come through you that you're going to have a nation of descendants. And what I want to do is I want to bless the world through you. And sure enough, that came to be. Abraham's family became a nation. And this nation grew and multiplied, and, and they're so numerous. But, but this nation was in slavery. They were, they were slaves in Egypt. And God said, like, that's not the way it's supposed to be. So he rescued them, miraculously saved them, and said, like, you will be my people. And he entered into a relationship with them. And this people, they were promised a land. They were supposed to go into this land called Israel, called the promised land, and, and they would enter in, and they were supposed to take possession. This is where you're going to live. This is going to be your home. And they did, eventually. Kind of bumpy along the way, but they got there. And, and while they were there, were they the people of God? No. They rejected him. They wanted to have a king. They wanted to do things their own way. And it was just this long saga of them rejecting and running away from God. And that's where we kind of left off last week, where God said, like, I want, to, I want to meet you where you are. I want to give you a king, but you need a good king. You need a particular king. And, and he, well, there were good kings along the way, but there were also a lot of bad kings that led them astray. And so where we pick up in the story today is we're going to see what happens to those kingdoms. There was one kingdom to start that ended up being split. They were divided. And these two kingdoms, what happened to them? We're going to see that they go into exile. 
They're going to go into exile. We're going to come back to that in just a moment. But what we're doing in this series, we're tracing the storyline, but we're also tracing several themes. So I just want to quick remind you what they are, these six themes that we're watching throughout the story. And so the first one, trust, like we're to trust God. That's how this goes best. And then we're to be partners. You kind of, we've talked about that. We're to work with him to bring good in the world, but we don't. We rebel, and this rebellion, this going our own way, leads to death. And this is the problem that we see in the scriptures that God's trying to solve. But because of who he is, this number four, this theme of hesed, this is a Hebrew word of love. It's not romantic love, but it's this deep, rich kind of love that God has for us. Because of this, it leads him to operate in grace, number five, where he gives us what we don't deserve. We, 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 we're getting all of this favor from him, even though we don't warrant it. We can't earn it, but he still gives it to us anyway. He operates in grace to ultimately bring about the last one, number six, redemption, where there's rescue, where there's being, people are being saved and we're being set free from the bondage that we're in, this, this slavery that we're kind of in. And that's the storyline that we're tracing out with these themes. And we're going to see these themes kind of play out as we arrive at this moment for Israel. And what they do is they continually reject God and they land in exile. Now, the, the dictionary definition of exile is being banished from your land, your home, your country, right? That's the dictionary definition. But I hope that you see today that that's exactly what happens to Israel, but it's so much more than that too. Because we actually face a kind of exile in our lives. We, we ourselves are kind of banished from this home that we're, we're to operate in. And we're going we're gonna to flesh that out in just a minute. Because when I say home, like all of these things, what it means... You probably think like, yeah, but I don't see that all the time. We face exile in our lives. And so as we dig into the story today, we're going to see what does God do in light of that? Like what happens when there is exile? Like how does God respond? How does he work? That's what we're going to uncover today. So I invite you, if you would, to turn to the book of Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles, we're going to be looking at chapter 36, and this is the end of the kingdoms. Like, here's the end of the story for Israel. What's taking place? Now, if you're not familiar with your Bibles, um, Second Chronicles is kind of like in the, the first third, so right here is where it is in my Bible. Like, you can kind of see where it is. I just recommend you go to your table of contents, right, and just go look up the page number, and, and Second Chronicles, and we're going to be looking at chapter 36. Second Chronicles, chapter 36. So quick reminder again, last week we left off with the kingdom being established, and David, he was the second king, and he was the best king that they had ever had. But David wasn't a perfect guy. And his son Solomon, he carried the kingdom into prosperity. It was a good thing, but soon after that, things fell apart very quickly, and the kingdom split. And the northern kingdom, called Israel, was uh, you know, camping out in the, in the city of Samaria, and then there's the southern kingdom of Judah, and this is where Jerusalem is. These were two separate kingdoms but they went on a very similar path. Because what happens is you had some good kings in there who were call the people to lead them back into the relationship with the Lord, but most of the kings were terrible. They led the people astray. They brought you know, war and famine, and they, and they brought challenge and brought idolatry. Like, they're rejecting God. And so what happens is we get to this moment in the end of Second Chronicles where God has been warning them, don't go down this road, don't go down this road, and we see what happens. So let's pick up in verse 15 of Second Chronicles. And as I read, I'm going to kind of elaborate on some of the story. The Lord, the God of their ancestors, sent word to them through his messengers again and again, because he had pity on his people and on his dwelling place. So what, what we're talking about here is that God, along the way, he's sending messengers or prophets. And if you kind of read the Bible, you'll see several books with different names on them, Micah, Nahum, Jeremiah. These are all prophets. And what these prophets do is they speak to the people and say, hey, like, the way things are, like, how this is, is not good. Like, we can't operate this way. Prophets were less about, like, fortune-telling, though they'd occasionally tell the future because God would show them. But they're more about calling for change right now and saying, like, if you go down this road, this is not going to end well. That's what the prophets are saying. But here's how the people respond but they mocked God's messengers, despised his words, and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord was aroused against his people, and there was no remedy. Now, what, what's happening here is that God is continually sending messengers. Maybe just to couch the timeline a little bit, 
from the time of Saul, the first king, and David and Solomon to this point has been centuries. Like this has been centuries of time, and God is continuing saying, hey, come back to me, come back to me. But after all that long, things just aren't getting better. And so it just gets to the place where something has to change. And so that's where we are. Something has to change. He brought up against them the king of the Babylonians, who killed their young men with a sword in the sanctuary and did not spare young men or young women, the elderly or the infirm. God gave them into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. He carried to Babylon all of the articles of the temple, both large and small, and the treasures of the Lord's temple and the treasures of the king and his officials. They set fire to God's temple and broke down the wall of Jerusalem. They burned all of the palaces and destroyed everything of value there. Now, what's noted here is that God's temple, like this represented where God dwelled, like he lived with them kind of in the temple, like that's what that meant. So for Nebuchadnezzar to come in and take all the furniture, all the gold, all the stuff that's in it, and then burn it down was a symbol to say that God is not with us anymore. And he knocks down all of that. He tears down the walls. Like, now the city is lying in ruin. Like, ooh, things are not looking good. Verse 20. He carried into exile to Babylon the remnant who escaped from the sword, and they became servants to him and his successors until the kingdom of Persia came to power. Now, does this sound familiar? Like, where did this nation start? They started as as slaves in Egypt. Here they are being taken captive once again, this time to the Babylonians. Read one more verse. The land enjoyed its Sabbath rests. All the time of its desolation it rested until the 70 years were completed by the fulfillment of the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah. So right here is a little bit of a reference to some of the things that they weren't doing. Like right here, we see the land is getting its Sabbath rest. We did a series on Sabbath. We talked about that um, several months ago. But this was a time where it's just like, okay, it's letting the land just settle into what God wanted for it. Because what had happened, these people were doing evil. And they're polluting it and and kind of destroying it. and, And it wasn't the way things were supposed to be. Well, now God is almost saying, like, now it gets to rest. It gets to be what it needs to be. And notice for how long. 70 years. Now, on on one hand, like, this has been centuries building up. And so, like, we've got hundreds of years coming, and now it's 70 years. Like, feel the contrast to that. Like, how brief this really was. Because it's like, long time, long time, okay, fine, something, but then it's over. 70 years. But there's significance to it, too. The number seven means, like, completion. Like, it's, it's complete or fullness. Like, that's what the number seven represents. And then you get the multiple of seven. You kind of magnify it by ten. Like there it's like complete full rest in in a, in a great way. And so the number is significant. It communicates meaning as well. So God is almost saying like I am giving the land its complete rest. Seventy years of exile. And so what we see here is God has been so patient with them. Again, centuries have gone on. He's been warning them and warning them. They have not taken heed But here, finally, something needed to change. He needed to do a drastic act. He needed to exile the people. Again, this is being banished from your land, your country. But this isn't the first time that we actually see a bit of an exile. If you think back, where did the first exile occur? It was actually in the garden, right? Adam and Eve, the the, the people that God has said, like, I want to work with you, I want to partner with you, and they reject him. Like, they don't do it his way. And what what happens? He has to send them out. They're exiled. And what brought with that was death. And then we see later on, like, as as the, the people multiply and expand, we get to the place where there's so much evil in the world that they're wanting to build their own name up. And they, they all kind of congregate in a town called Babel. And they're building this giant tower. They want to be like, well, let's show how great we are because we can do this. And what God has to do is he has to scatter them. He exiles them and they spread out from that place. Of note, Babel, that location, is the same place that Babylon is. Babel and Babylon are related. 
And so when the Israelites hear like Babylon, they're immediately thinking about what happened. Like these are the connections that are being made. And so right here we see the pinnacle of human evil. But it's not just out there, it's in God's people too. When, the, when he rescued them from Egypt, he saved them. You know, they're no longer slaves and, and it's like, let's be my people and I'm going to take you to this land that I promised you. What happens? They don't go in because they're scared, they don't trust God, and they end up being in exile for 40 years. They're wandering in the desert. God is like, we need, to, we need to work on this before you go into the land. Eventually they do, but like here, we just see the theme of exile over and over again. And so what I want to do is when we hear about the exile, when we hear about them being taken out of their land, it's literally happening, like this political kind of thing, but it's deeper than that. It, this, this exile isn't just a like, banishment from your land. It's being far from home and being far from the way things are supposed to be. So literally, the word means banished from your land, but I want to move us to see the exile is being far from home. It's being uh, away from where things are supposed to be. And what we see, what we see is that this is inside of us. It's inside of people. It's not just some external kind of thing, but it's actually inside of us. Because I think the ultimate exile is death. I mean, think about death in that way. Like the, the nation right here, as it's being oppressed and, and overrun, it's dying. Israel as a nation is dead. Exile right at the beginning of the story resulted in death. Death is a form of exile. It's being fully separated from what God wants for us. And, and so when we start to think about like our own lives, like where do you see exile? Where do you see that you aren't home Things aren't quite the way that they're supposed to be. Because I think we all experience exile in our lives. For me, I, I felt it pretty acutely when I was in college. So uh, I, I kind of grown up in the, the, the stream or the thought process that the more that I did and the more that I did well, the more valuable or, or more important I was. Like I was, I was defined, I was defining my value on how well I performed in things. And so by the time I get to college, I was in everything. So I'm going to college, I got a full load of classes, I'm an athlete, um, I was doing on-campus ministry, and I was connected to some groups and teams, like serving in some different ways and contributing, and so all of a sudden, I've just got all of this stuff in my life. Like, my schedule is jam-packed, and I thought, like, yeah, the more that I do, the more that I do well, that means I'm really important. I was an achiever. But it got to the place where I was doing too much. Like, I couldn't sustain all of this. And so, like, where I'm, like, starting to become late to every meeting, like, my schedule was so jam-packed, like, I couldn't be on time anymore. And, like, grades were starting to slip. Like, I just wasn't doing as well in school. I was just stretched. Like, I wouldn't turn things in on time or maybe wouldn't turn it in at all. And so I'm just, like, missing all of these things. And, like, I'm, I'm just so filled in my schedule, like, doing so much that, like, I can't keep up. But people would ask me, like, hey, how you doing? I'm like, oh, I'm great. I'm great. I'm doing awesome right there. Like, I'm lying to people, because I wasn't great. I was struggling. I was overwhelmed. I was burning out. But here I am. I'm telling people, like, yeah, I'm fine. I'm great. I got it. I got it. And, and, and that's what happens. In these moments where we're, we're operating in our own way, like, we're stepping into exile. Because what I noticed about that was how isolating all of that was. Like, I was distancing myself from other people. I wasn't letting people close. I wasn't letting them in. I didn't want them to see, like, I didn't have it all together. Like, I'm starting to fall apart. I'm starting to fail. Like, I didn't want people to see that. And so I'm, I'm distancing myself. I'm isolating myself from others. And I did that to the Lord. Like, I walked, I, I walked away from him, but I just put some distance because I was just so burned out and overwhelmed. And I wasn't connecting with him. He was still always there, but I wasn't, I wasn't attuned to him. I was like this with him. And that is what exile is. It's isolation. It's separation. It's not being home and safe and contentment, but it's being in chaos. And so much of my time like in college was my own making. Like the, I caused so much of this, but some of it happened to me at the same time. And so I'm living in this period where I, this it's a dry period. It's a desert. It's like I'm in exile. 
And that, that happens in our lives. We come to these moments where, like, exile can take many forms. And, and we walk through periods where we are not, we're not connected to home. We're not connected to, to people. We're isolated. We're on our own. I don't know what that is for you. Like, when you think of home, maybe you think of a home that wasn't a home. It wasn't characterized by belonging, by, by love, by contentment, by safety, by fulfillment. It wasn't that. Home was not a place you wanted to be. Maybe you're in a period right now where your job is just terrible. Like, Monday morning you wake up, it's like, okay, and there's no fulfillment. There's no purpose. Like, why do I get up and do this? And you feel empty. Or maybe you lost your job, and you're like, I want a job, and I, I love what I did, but I don't have it anymore, and now what do I do? Exile. Or maybe it's more internal for you. Maybe it's anxiety or depression. You just feel that isolation, that loneliness. Like you can be sitting in a room of people and you feel like there's nobody around you. And you're just, you feel down. You feel empty. You feel like nothing is working the way it's supposed to. Or maybe it's relational. Like every time you walk up and you see some, the same person, it's like, oh no, like I got to see this person. It's a friend or a coworker or a family member and things aren't right. Like you're sideways and every time you see them, you're just like, I don't want to be in the room right now. Like exile. Or maybe it's even in your marriage. Like you feel that with your spouse, the person you're sharing life with and it's just not working. And maybe it's your fault. Like maybe you have done something wrong that like you've driven a wedge there, whether you realize it or not. Or maybe it's happened to you. Or maybe it, it's, it's an addiction, like something serious deep down, you just cannot shake it. Like sometimes you have moments of clarity where like you see like this is not the way things are supposed to be and you try to walk away from it, but then it comes right back and you're just like this and you're lost in it. You're in exile. Like what is it for you? What are these moments where you just feel like I, I'm in exile, I, I feel empty, I feel lost, I feel isolated, I don't belong. I don't feel home. Where do you feel that right now? This is what the people of Israel felt. They belonged in that land like God had promised to them, and now it's gone. Like it's all falling apart. They lost their nation. They're not a people anymore. Now what? What does God have to say to that? What does he have to say to you? Is this the end of the story? Have sin and death won? Is this it? It's not. It's not. I want to read you two, two verses, two passages. This is what God says. I'm going to put three up on the screen, but I'm going to read two of them. From Jeremiah 29. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are complete for Babylon, I will come to you, and I will fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. When you seek me and find me, you will find me, and you will seek me with all of your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from the nations and the places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. Ezekiel 36, verse 24. For I will take you out of the nations, I will gather you back from all of the countries and bring you back to the land that I will show you. I will sprinkle clean water on you. I will cleanse you, and you will be clean from all of your impurities and from all of your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Then you will live in the land I gave your ancestors. You will be my people and I will be your God. God restores. God restores. That's what he did for the Israelites. 
You see, they were taken into captivity, 70 years, banished from their land. And then what happens? The king of Persia rises to power, overtakes Babylon, and he says, I'm sending you back. And the Chronicles verse up there talks about how he, from the Lord, was told, I'm sending you back to build a temple to the Lord. Like, I'm releasing you. You're going to go back to your land. And sure enough, that's what happens. The books of Ezra and Nehemiah describe this returning back to the land after the exile. God restored the nation. God restored the nation because that is who he is. That is what he does. Centuries of, of waywardness. They're wandering away, wandering away. He's so patient with them, but finally he's got to do something. And he allows them to go into exile. But then he restores. Seven years later, he brings them back because this is who he is. And he is the same way with us. When there's exile, God can bring about restoration. This is his character. This is his nature. This is what he can do. God brings about restoration. This is character. Now, just to, to kind of clarify this for you, that doesn't mean everything always goes well. Because what happens, if you kind of put yourself in, in the, the timeline, this is 70 years. That is actually a long time for one person. And there were some people who went into exile and they died. They never saw the restoration. There were some people who were young enough that maybe they remember, but they lived through the entire exile. 70 years. Some people were born into it. So the promise is not that everything's going to be great. The promise is that there will be restoration to come. And it might take a while. And it may not be what you think it will be. But God does restore. And when the people, they came back, they came back and they built the temple, they built the wall back up, they're establishing the city. And so when the temple was finished, something didn't happen. God's presence didn't come into that temple. Previously, when they built the tabernacle, this tent, this movable tent, they finished it, God's presence came down in a light and a fire and a cloud. And then when they built the permanent temple, Solomon, and that story, he came down in the same kind of way he inhabited. He's like, here, I'm living with you. The second temple, he didn't come live in it. He didn't show up. Things are not quite the same. But what we see is that someone does come. Today is Palm Sunday. Today's Paul Sunday. It's the day that we remember that when Jesus was on the earth, he came into Jerusalem the week before he dies, and he comes riding on a donkey. And what the people were looking forward to was one to come who would lead them back to truly into the kind of kingdom that God had promised. God's presence had not been dwelling with them. There was, there was no presence in the temple. But here comes one on a donkey foreshadowed in, in the Old Testament, there would be a king who would lead them back into God's presence, back into the kingdom. Here he is. And that's who Jesus is. So the moment that he walked into the temple, the presence was restored. But it wouldn't be as they thought. So the nation of Israel wouldn't endure like they pictured. But Jesus came to do something new. But all of this is what God does. He restores. And that happens primarily through Jesus. Jesus. That's what he does. How does he do it? Like, what, what does this restoration look like? Well, I want to look at one other text um, and have you turn to Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel 37. So we just read a little bit of Ezekiel. I want you to turn there if you're able. Ezekiel 37. I want to read kind of a famous story, one that, that's pretty well known for those who have studied the Bible much. This is the, the story of the Valley of the Dry Bones. So Ezekiel, he's a prophet. He's a messenger. He's proclaiming like, Go follow the Lord, otherwise things won't go well. He's, ha he's a prophet at this time when the exile is like on the cusp and, and as things are unfolding. And God shows him this picture. He's like, Ezekiel, come here. I want to show you something. And he takes him to a valley. And what he sees in this valley are these bones, these skeletons, like people's dead, decayed bodies. And he sees them everywhere. And God says, watch what I'm going to do. Speak to them. And so Ezekiel does. Suddenly, these bones start to rise up and come together. It's a, kind of a miraculous sort of thing, like this picture of these skeletons coming together. And then they're covered in skin and bone and, and flesh, and, and, and they become like people. And then he says, now, speak life. 
speak the breath of life over them. Just like in, in, in uh, the beginning, in Genesis 1 and 2, speak life. And so he does. And sure enough, the wind comes and life. And now these people are alive again. And here's what God says to Ezekiel in verse 11. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say, our bones are dried up, our hope is gone, we are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says, my people, my people, I am going to open up your graves. I'm going to bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open up your graves, when I bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you and you will live. And I will settle you in your own land. Then, then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and I have done it, declares the Lord. I mean, come on here, right? Like here is a beautiful picture of God taking this dead nation. They were dead. They were in exile. I'm going to make you alive again. Resurrection. It's right here in the Old Testament. God brings life out of death. This is what the book of Genesis was talking about. When we talked about the story of Joseph, how like all these bad things happened to him, but God was using it for good. God brings good things out of bad. And here it is, the ultimate bad, death. God brings life. And next week, we're going to get there. We're going to get to see how this comes to fruition, but I'm going to leave it there because next week it's going to be awesome to see what God does, not just for the nation, but for the world to truly deal with death. But right here we see how God does it. He brings life out of death. He takes dead things, broken things, and he restores. And he does it by speaking. He does it by bringing life to bear. So when there's exile... God can bring about restoration. But notice, sometimes we have to go through the exile. Sometimes we have to go through the hard things. Sometimes destruction is needed to bring restoration. Sometimes we have to go through the heart of it. And so, how do we respond? Like when we're faced with these moments of, of destruction, of exile, of death, like things aren't as they should be, what are we supposed to do? How are, are we to respond? I, I think is we, we're to live for our true home. We're to, to live for our true home. And let me illustrate it by what God says to the people while they're in exile. So I want to go back to Jeremiah 29. Don't feel like you've got to turn there. But Jeremiah 29, verses 4 through 7, God is speaking to those people while they're in exile. And this is what he says. This is what the Lord God Almighty, the God of Israel, says to those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons. Give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there and do not decrease. Seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it. Because if it prospers, you too will prosper. He called them to live in exile as the people that he had originally called them to be. It wasn't the land that was anything special. It's not like you live here in this space, that's what makes you special. No, no, no. It's the people that you are and what you bring. Because what God is saying here is bring the blessing. All the way back at the beginning, like, be fruitful and multiply. Like, spread life. I want you to do that in exile. And so I think the takeaway for us is that we are to live for our true home. And our true home is the kingdom of God. And what I don't mean to say here is heaven. Don't hear me. What I'm not saying is, like, we need to look forward to heaven, so just kind of hunker down and just wait till Jesus comes back or that you die. That's not what this is saying. He's telling them, be where you are, seek the prosperity of the city. Like, be the light, be kingdom people right where you're planted. Don't wait for it, don't try to avoid the world and, and you, know, you know, put yourself out like, don't get here. 
but seek the good of it. Be my people who live according to the kingdom right where you are. We're not waiting for heaven. We're not waiting till we get there. Like, we are doing it now. So what does that look like for you? Maybe for you, you feel an exile right now that is not of your own making. Like it is totally circumstantial and just bad things are happening to you and you don't really know where to turn. What does it look like for you? God's promise is I am there, so look for me. Seek me and you will find me. So maybe right now for you, you just feel exile, you feel that oppression. Look for him. Step back, try to open your eyes and say, all right, where are you, Lord? And trust that he'll reveal himself. Like, see how you can be his follower amidst the challenge. Seek him. Go towards him. Look for him. Maybe you're in an exile. That is your fault. Like the Israelites, like you caused it. This was your making. What is it for you? It's still the same. Seek him. But this time it means turning like maybe you're, you're locked on to something like, I got to be this way, or you just, you're trusting in other things. Maybe it's letting that go and turning to him and seeking him. We are looking for our true home. We're looking for the place where we feel like we belong, where we can rest, where we can be who we are. That is with Jesus. So seek him. Live for your true home. Live for the reality that he's trying to build. Be people who are loving who are generous, gracious, be like him right where you are, in your exile, in the challenge. Look for ways that you can begin to embody him. Seek him. This is what it looks like. When there's exile, God can bring about restoration. God can bring about restoration. That is the good news. That is his promise. And that is what he wants to ultimately provide for you wherever you are. So that's the good news. Church family, when there's exile, God can bring about restoration. Would you join me in a word of prayer? God, thank you that you do promise restoration, that we ultimately see that in Jesus. We ultimately see that in how he works, how he brings about the kind of thing that we need God, I pray wherever we are right now, whatever exile that we might face, would we begin to seek you? Would we begin to live for our true home, which is with you? And God, show us how we can do that. Lord, if it is our own making, if we are in isolation, if we are by ourselves, God, bring the right people into our lives and show us what we need to see. But God, if it's something that's just happening to us, I pray, Lord, that you would bring us through. Help us to seek you. Help us to remain steadfast. When we might be tempted, we might be wanting to turn, we might want to give in or give up. Lord, when we face exile, would we look to you for the right kind of restoration? Help us to do that, God. We love you, we trust you, and we're grateful to you, Lord. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.
is faithful. He is. A couple quick reminders for you. Um, stop by the Connections desk, grab daddy-daughter tickets. We want to take advantage of that. We've got more Easter invite cards. Uh, we'd love to have you take some of those, pass those out to people that you're wanting to invite. And then be watching for the one service information. Again, we're shooting from May 1st, 10 o'clock. That's the, the date and time. But uh, be watching in case we need to adjust that at all. And then finally, today is our Easter egg hunt. So families, if you've got kids, go grab them right now at a kid's life. And we're going to get over to the Heart Soul Center. We'd love for you to join us and uh, enjoy the blitz of, of all the eggs and all that kind of stuff. But church family, 
Go this week, knowing that whatever exile you face, whatever exile you will face, God is faithful. He will restore. So seek him and live for your true home. Have a great week.